I wanted to make a video on my thoughts on Easter. Actually, this is how Easter fits on the template, the self-healing template. My name is Dan Paulson and welcome to the channel. All I do is look for that template. I found it. If you follow my work, you know that I'm finding, pe people call those myth. They're not mythologies. What they are is there is a, a human life cycle template that is sequencing and the stories about Jesus, about the prophets, about um, Jason and the Argonauts, all of these things from antiquity are built on, they're following that sequence right there. You know, if we saw Jason going through the clashing rocks and barely making it, that's the same place where Moses is going through the, the Red Sea and barely making it, that we're seeing conceptual parts of the story in the background. And both of those represent the idea of turning inward to a difficult place, turning inward to your mind. The threshold is up here and escaping the past. Yeah. When Jesus started right after he crossed the first threshold, which was his baptism, he was 40 days in the desert, just like after the Israelites with Moses Across the threshold of the Red Sea, they spent 40 years in the desert. If you go back to the first occurrence of that, actually, how long did it rain for the flood? 40 days and 40 nights. That's how long it took for the changes to take place as the old self is being destroyed and the new self is coming about. So 40 is looking like this common repetitive number that is being used to represent that time um, and until purity, if you continue to look for the conceptual idea and the mental idea and what is the commonality, right after crossing a threshold, 40 occurs. What is the 40? We're trying to heal. So that's what the number looks like it correlates to. And that's how Abrahamic material is, is sneaking stuff in. It's a, it's a verbal puzzle traveling verbally. There's patterned things that are happening here and the Abrahamic material is using a numbering system to obscure everything. But the numbers repeat so often, it should get your attention. All of those elements are there, and that's what um, I've been doing on my channel. Now, without getting into more of that, you're either on board with that or not. What I want to do is suggest that in the material, Jesus is resurrected on the template for us a very specific reason. Now, now, Easter, we know it. As a kid, I liked Easter because... Home was very strict and very limited, and we were very remote. And uh, but there were relatives in the city nearby. And uh, when Easter came, we always we had property, so they would all come out on a Sunday afternoon after church, and you know we'd have the Easter egg hunt and all that kind of stuff. So there was chocolate, there was candy, there was potato chips, there was things that we didn't normally get that day. And I loved Easter for that reason. Um, as far as the rest of it is that when you're a little kid, that's what you like, you know, you eventually grow up and you realize, okay, this is in, um, in Christian religion. Basically it commemorates, uh, Jesus's resurrection. It commemorates the idea that Jesus has now risen from the dead, which what it completes the process that I am a sinner. And since I'm a sinner, Jesus came and died on the cross to save me from my sins. So if I just worship him, boom, I'm absolved from my sins is the mental process there. They don't figure, they don't, they don't stop and look that you were handed that fear of sin by the very same church that's handing you the salvation. They don't think through that part. You, know? <laughs> you had salvation before you were handed sin. You just don't know that. People that are convinced that that's true, are that's it. At any rate, that's how that goes. Okay, but how does it work on the template? If you've been following my work, you realize that this is a an inner mental path of resolving one's issues from early life and, then, and that in the process of doing so, we let those go, we cease to feel them, we cease to live life with those as parts of our nested experiences that are continuing to help steer the course of our life. So there's this process that goes on and on. And in most teachings, there's this idea that I am, I am an unenlightened being until I realize that, oh, I have to become self-aware, turn inward and let go of the things that I hold on to. And as soon as I do that, I'm enlightened. That's a story right there. However, it is a very abbreviated story because in reality, I mean, that's what you want to do, right? You want to turn inward and resolve the things that keep you held down and then everything will be okay. What we don't realize is that that can take years and so much emotional pain for it to happen that we're going in cyclically over and over and over again until we get to a certain point. The stories don't always contain that. 
in the Bible that is in there. You will see monomyth after monomyth after monomyth in the Bible. Um, whenever there's prophets or, you know, people going on healing adventures, uh, other videos. What is Easter? In Abrahamic material, as far as the Christians were concerned at that time with this material, Jesus' resurrection represented something that um, that really shows the idea of this is this is the final time that I turn inward. I am now enlightened. Jesus is an enlightened being. Okay, let, let's look at something by comparison. First of all, we're going to go to Buddha. And Buddha teaches, if you don't know Buddhism, Buddha is a human being that learned about enlightenment, learned how to uh, get enlightenment, find enlightenment from within inside, and then taught others how to do that same thing. So he's not any kind of a, a spirit or, you know, something above human. He was a, you know, like a prophet or something like that in other cultures. He would be somebody who understood and learned something and taught a process. Buddha uh, is teaching on the same self-healing template, the turning inward and all of that. But Buddha teaches that everybody has a Buddha nature. The Buddha means the enlightened one. Everybody that is enlightened becomes a Buddha, therefore. Um, it, it, we're not following and worshiping a, a Buddha. We're listening to Buddha tell us what to do. Then we are doing that same thing ourselves. And then once we've accomplished that, we are like the Buddha. We have a Buddha nature. So he starts out in life as Sudartha Gautama, but after enlightenment, he is the Buddha. Now, if we take that over to Christianity, we see that there's something different going on in the analogs and the way people hold on to them emotionally. But basically, if you look at it, you're going to see that Jesus is the one that died and Christ is the one that rose and that everybody has a Christ nature, but we're not supposed to worship Jesus. That's the shell. That's what the Christians do. That's what keeps it available and keeps it here. But to really apply it and to use it and to interact with it, what we must understand is that we are that. We are that part of the story. This represents, what are the sevens and threes? Do you know my work? Day seven in Genesis. And on day seven, God finished the work that he had done. And God saw that on day seven, the work that he had done was good. So God rested on day seven from all the work that he had done. So three times day seven is said right there in this three and seven numbering sequence begins in Genesis that is in my previous videos. I'm not going to get into now. And by that, I mean, I want to explain how it works because it's a very big process, but basically seven and three right here is going to correlate to a point in the story. This is, it's about us. This is a time in our life when what is called naked, unashamed in the garden of Eden, that we are conscious selves, our, our higher or our consciousness and our subconscious, our male and our female, or Adam and Eve are in place, but we haven't experienced life yet. We haven't had first sin. We are naked, which means we're not covered by anything. We're unashamed. We don't, we're not ashamed. Later on, we are going to be covered with stuff. We're going to be covered with shame after we have life experiences, which is going to be called first sin. And then we're going to have continual pain and uh, childbirth afterwards, which is the cyclical pain. That is how that's, it starts off in, in this material. Three is the pure place before we experience sin. And we're always looking for this pure place. Three and seven. How many days was Jesus in the tomb? He's put into a tomb, crosses a threshold. It gets closed off. You're in a devoid place. Three days later, you emerge glowing white, pure white. If we were to look at a comparison, the first time that it happened in Okay, this is the last time. When did it happen the first time in the in Abrahamic material in the Bible? Noah and the flood. We are Noah going on the adventure. The earth represents our old life. We want to flood that completely out. So we do. We flood out the earth and we start anew. And then we are what on the other side? We are naked, which represents the idea that we are now uncovered from whatever whatever that hurt was in the world. We are now naked. We have uh, grown a vineyard, which represents we have now started a new life, created a new life, uh, made uh, grew some wine from there and are drinking from. It. We are now experiencing a new life and feeling good and we are uncovered. So that was a good place right there. Here later on, having Jesus emerge naked would not be a good thing. However, they've changed it from being naked to being covered in something that is so pure white that it's it's like you're covered with nothing anyway. Whatever you have over you is is all good. And that's what Jesus was. So Jesus in on in um in Christian the idea represents this idea that Jesus died for your sins. And 
that he's going to return someday. I'll talk about apocalypticism in a little bit too, but the reality of it, is, of it is, is it represents you have been starting from Noah to go in and self-heal, and by the time you get to Jesus, you've resolved the last thing. You have now, ah, oh, I am now an enlightened being. That is how it would work. As far as Jesus, as far as the return, Jesus said, um, boy, what, I don't remember exactly what it was, but there's a number of places we get the idea that Jesus is telling us that you know, to be ready, the end is at any time, it's here now, it's uh, in some places we're told it is here now and people do not see it. So what is, this is very cryptic, what does that mean? And if you turn it inward and use it, that means that the return of Christ happens and it happens repeatedly. It happens every time somebody turns inward and goes on this path. In the same way you would achieve a Buddha nature by doing what Buddha teaches, turning inward and healing, you are interpreting Jesus and turning inward and finding what he would call a Christ nature or what this material would call a Christ nature by internally healing. It's the same mental process held in different ways for different people. So a Christ is a Buddha. At some level, we have to understand they're not doing this in plain language. They're doing it conceptually and that it plays out in the mind and that Seeking emptiness, as Buddha would teach, in order to find nirvana is going to be the same thing as becoming poor in spirit, as Jesus would teach, to find the kingdom of God. That those are the same thing when, when we understand they're conceptual. We tend to take Buddhism and go, okay, I get that. But the Jesus one, that's something, that's, that's how it was written. You can see how it's, how it functions. And a Buddha and a Christ both return every time somebody becomes a Buddha or a Christ. Waiting for the physical return is what the shell is for. And how long is that going to happen? If you follow Jesus and he says it's here now, what does that mean? He was either wrong or he knew something that we don't know. We're supposed to interpret it. Interpret it. it is here now. It is every time you turn in and find your inner peace. So Jesus that bra that last one represents that final enlightenment. Yeah, and you know, there's people that argue that it was also said that you know, Jesus at some point said it um, that you ne you don't know when it's going to arrive, and um, that's also true. If uh, boy, it seems odd in a you know in a spiritual teaching if this is Jesus, the Son of God, and it's really the gospel and it's infallible. How come it says it's it's near? It's it's coming very soon. Be ready. And then nobody ever knows when it's going to, but it's, it's, then it's 2000 years later. So you have to stop at some point and go, Hmm, something's not right here. <laughs> okay. It, it is exactly right. Always. It was right then. It, it's right now. And it was right all the time in between. If we look at it in the mind, this is about enlightenment and the, um, Jesus ends up being the component part of the mind that is the called self and God is the higher awareness that has to work together with the, the inner self. You're, you're working to resolve things. So what we have right here is that, 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 um, this connection is always nearby. It's always close. This turning inward, the, the end of your own suffering is always near. If you, however, follow Jesus's teachings. This is where the church, when it says just worship him, what they did is they gathered up a lot of people that are willing to do that, but are not going to understand even what Jesus teaches. That there's so many different Christian denominations. There's people that read Jesus and there's people that only read the verse that says he flipped over tables and threw people out, which means that, you know, I can protest and be angry and mad in the name of Jesus and destroy people. So that's what they get out of Jesus. Some people get that much out. Um, but the, what Jesus himself, if you step back and get out of the religion and say, what is Jesus saying? What does his sermon say? He, th there's at no point in time does he ever say, you know what, by the way, if you just worship me, I got this for you. No, that's what Paul tells you. That's what the religion tells you. Jesus didn't. Who are you going to listen to? People listen to who the easy one is. I'd be worried about what Jesus says, not about what somebody, an underling later that says, yeah, just do this instead. I would not do that. I want to go upstream to the master. I don't want somebody in between to, to change up what I need to do and then tell me. If you do what Jesus says and forget about the church, you're going to find out you're on an inward path to enlightenment that is different. And that is always near. And it continues to emerge. Every time somebody turns inward and follows his path 
instead of worshiping him or denying him, but realizing, you know what, this is a pathway he's pointing to, like a Buddha, like a Lao Tzu, about my inner being and about my inner salvation and the quality of my life as a result of where I come from. And this is letting me know how that happened and how I let myself free of it. However, it's contained in ways that is going to have other other purposes in the population. What do you want? Do you want to deny it? Do you want to accept it? Or do you want to say, ooh, something's in there that is for me, that's interactive, that is a framework that exists elsewhere? What is that? That's the mystery right there. That's what this, That's and that's what this is. So Easter represents then, or the actually what it, well, no, that's not right. What I mean to say is that Jesus's final resurrection represents your final, whew, I finally let it all go. Not just a couple things, but all of it. I am now, I, I, am, I am bathed in purity. I have no blemishes on me anymore. Yeah, that's what it is. So anyway, I wanted to say that it, it definitely fits. It's a big thing. You can see how important it is in culture and in society. I don't mind saying this now because I realize this doesn't go anywhere. It's, it's not interesting to uh, more than a handful of people. So, okay, well, that is it. Yeah. Easter commemorates that day when Jesus is resurrected, which, you know, completes the promise as far as they're concerned. And if you step back and, and say, if this fits on a template and it was maintained on a template carefully by somebody in the background, what does it replicate? You can see that it replicates a rebirth time, an emergence in and a um, coming out in a, in a different state, which is what we're doing when we go in and heal. We're going inward, we're healing from something, and then we're emerging again. Then we're living life naked for a while, then get recovered, and then go experience it again. We are, as the story goes along, we, each one of the people are iterations of our next self. Remembering this is 3,500 year old stuff in, you know, early, uh, Torah material and 2000 in the New Testament. So, and and even a little bit older than that. So it's pretty old material. We kind of are out of touch with it. We can't treat it historical. That's a disservice. There's something in here. Um, but the historical is what creates the, the religion. And then there's the deniers of it who say that can't have happened. There's something in here that neither of those sides are looking at that, that I'm looking at. And it's a path to inner peace. It would be the same path anywhere on the world, in the world. Um, it's the same thing. And that, uh, honestly, that the, that even though Easter commemorates that day that on the template, the final resurrection, um, represents your final inward. I've gotten rid of the la last of it. I am good. I'm not covered with anything. You can know anything about me and I don't even care. It's already out there. That is pure. And then, and then having a joyous life, you've got other things going on. Instead, you are in that place where you want to be. You are in nirvana. You are in a good flow in the Tao, as, as um, Lao Tzu would teach. You are experiencing the kingdom of heaven within and experiencing the graces of God. If you are doing it in, in analogous material for um, a religious genre of story conveyance. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that <laughs> it's important. Yeah. It represents final purity. You know what? I want to say something that I, I don't believe I've said this before, but from a really stepped back position, what I see is that there is the way a human came about that we're born with certain qualities and then our life experiences and the way that we judge those experiences and continue to hold those is what we live through and continue to live through until we become aware of that and realize that and start looking inward to change those perceptions, which is a very difficult thing. We're, and that's going to go over and over again. And that is how a human anywhere on the planet is going to improve their life. And if they get together from different cultures and they share that together, they're going to be brothers and sisters. They're not going to be different races, different nationalities. They're not going to be they're going to be the same at a level that they get it, that the divisions are going to cease to happen. Jesus is not a divider himself. Okay, so what I see is that mythology is based on a sequence of that, the turning inward, the healing, the 
dealing with the demons, all that sort of stuff, the returning to life, the changes that happen as a result of the return, the difficulty in coming back. Why would it be difficult? I've healed. Because now you come back and you don't fit anymore. Your relationships are difficult. The places you are are difficult. There's more to that is built into these stories. Religion is built on that same framework with a different purpose. This serves as a wonderful big brother. Here's what's going on. Here's how you live and here's how you live your life. So that would become a very important part of the way that you create the analogous story components that hold that conceptual element. You can do that differently. Cyclical pain. How can you say that? Pain follows like a wheel. The tree continues to grow up and produces bad fruit and I chop it down and it grows and, you know, not until I pull it from the root does it cease. Pain in childbirth that continues and gets increasing leave harder every time. Why would that be? Because we are the ones that are having this happen and it gets worse as time goes on. The way these work is you have to make that shift in the analogs and treat them all the same way. So in the end, an individual should be able to look at this and recognize some sort of a symbology that you've gone into a, a place for the final time and that you've emerged completely pure this time. And as a result of that, you have now risen up above the the physical realm and that return happens again and again every time somebody follows that pathway right there that is what the that is what the framework is of the story understanding that you can treat these as historical or you can treat them as simply stories that never happened or in my case i treat them as stories that are framed on something very purposefully repetitive throughout all of antiquity. All right. Um, take care. I'll get back to my interpreting the Sermon on the Mount in the next video. See you on that one. Take care.